welcome, welcome everyone to, to the first uh, keynote lecture of this spring 2020 uh, in Florence. And I'm very honored and proud to introduce Dr. John Hooper. Uh, John Hooper has more than 40 experience as a journalist and has worked in radio, television, newspapers, magazines, and for a news agency. He is active on social media with almost 10,000 followers on Twitter. Hooper has dual citizenship, Irish and British, and uh, got his uh, degree from Cambridge University in history. After graduating, Hooper worked for the BBC and began his career as a foreign correspondent in Cyprus after the Turkish invasion of the island where he reported for a number of news organizations including the BBC, The Guardian, The Economist, uh, Rutter, and uh, NBC. Following the death of Spain dictator General Franco, Hooper was asked by The Guardian to become its correspondent in Madrid. Over the next three years, he covered the country's transition from dictatorship into democracy. After a spell of, uh, of the London staff of The Guardian, during which he also presented the BBC World Service program 24 hours, Hooper returned to Spain as correspondent for The Guardian, observer and economist. In 1984, he became uh, the correspondent for The Guardian and observer. In 1999 until 2003, he was Central Europe correspondent for the same two papers based in Berlin. Since 2003, he has been the Economist correspondent in Italy and for the Vatican. Over the course of his long career in journalism, John Hooper has covered several conflicts, including North Ireland, the Middle East, Algeria, and Kosovo. In 2001, he was in Afghanistan for the Battle of Tora Bora and search for Obama bin Laden. His book, The Spaniards, a portrait of the new Spain, won the 1987 Alan Lane Award for the best first work of history or literature. He later published two expanded and revised versions under the title of New Spaniards. And his latest book, The Italians, was published in 2015 by Penguin in the UK and Viking in the US, where it featured in the first bestsellers list of the Washington Post and Los Angeles Times. Tonight, John Hooper will give a lecture on peace, media and the peace. So please help me in welcoming Dr. John Hooper at Kent State Fund. Thank you, Fabrizio. Why, ladies and gentlemen, why? Why on earth did Fabrizio ask a journalist and someone with a track record as a war correspondent, what's more, to talk about peace when everyone knows that the media thrive on conflict? This is a question that puzzles not only some of you, no doubt, but also Google, or rather Google Mail. Those of you who use Gmail will know that as you write, it prompts you with what it thinks you want to say and finishes off your sentence. Now, earlier on, I was writing about this lecture, and I was putting it slightly the other way around, the media and peace, but I didn't get any further than the media and PEA when it finished off the sentence as peanuts. So the algorithm in Gmail believes that it was more likely that I would be talking tonight about the media and peanuts than that I could possibly be talking about the media and peace. Now, before I go any further, let me just say that I'm talking about the media tonight in its widest sense, and not just mainstream media, radio, TV, news websites, newspapers, news agencies, um, magazines, and so on, but also about social media and what you might call the creative media. That is to say, when, uh, for example, a filmmaker 
that wants to make a film about um, something that touches on reality to tell a story that it purports to be depicting reality, I'm calling that creative media. Do the media thrive on conflict? Unquestionably, yes. Though one might reasonably qualify that to say the media thrive on drama. Listen to the news on te radio or television, leaf through any news magazine, look at the front page of any newspaper or website, and you will see what I mean. Terrorism, war, murder, crime, civil disturbances, disasters, both natural and man-made, are what grab headlines, and they give rise to a phrase within the business that provided a friend of mine, former crime writer for the Guardian newspaper with the title of his book. Um, if it bleeds, so goes the saying, it leads. The same is true in a less violent way of political journalism. Clashes, splits and walkouts are the very stuff of political coverage. Only when we get to economic and social news do we get into calmer waters. But even here, what is dramatic, or even better catastrophic, makes news. Terrifying plunges on the stock market, hostile takeovers, rancorous divorces between celebrities, clashes between social activists and vested interests. These are what make news. Few kinds of news stories, in fact, interrupt this torrent of negative news. But there are exceptions. Sport, for example, can often provide, provide a cheer-up. The same is true of medical and pharmaceutical breakthroughs. Some arts and media stories radiate good news, like the recovery recently of a, a stolen painting, a Gustav Klimt, which was found hidden in a museum in Piacenza, the very museum from which it had been stolen back in 1997. But there again, many of the best arts and media stories also focus on conflict. They focus on rows and walkouts. It's hard to exaggerate the degree to which journalistic values are tied up with conflict and indeed war. Firstly, many journalists um, and myself included, inveigle their way into the profession or into the business of being a foreign correspondent by volunteering to report from conflict zones. Secondly, the profession has a system not unlike that which you find in the military of giving prizes, in the military it's medals, to those who are prepared to spend time in conflict zones. War correspondentship is exalted in many respects, and that helps to shape a mental outlook that sometimes shocks outsiders. A good story, what my Italian colleagues would call una bella storia, often involves pretty horrendous stuff. When producers of TV talk shows talk about good television, they often mean a first-class row has broken out during the show. Let me add a personal anecdote to this and a bit of a confession. The very first job I had was working for the BBC as a current affairs reporter, and um, they had a rather mistaken policy at the time of trying out reporters as producers. Actually, the two subdivisions of the profession are very, very different, and the people who do those jobs tend to be very different. But anyway, they put me in charge of running a very fast-paced news program one night, um, and my problem was that I didn't have a lead, I didn't have a really strong story to put at the top. And the news came through about 45 minutes before we went on the air of a a supposed plane crash at Heathrow Airport in London. A plane had apparently landed in flames and maybe people had been killed or injured or, or, or whatever. 
Um, and suddenly that went to the top of what we call the running order, the top of my list of stories that was going to open my program. Ten minutes later, the news came through that it had been a false scare. And I heard myself saying, damn. I was regretting that nobody's life had been endangered. And it brought me out of the start. I suddenly realised that I was being subjected to a dehumanising effect that I think gets through to all of us in the media. When we're upbraided about this concentration on bad news, the stock reply is, well, that's what sells. We're giving people what it is that they want. Now, I think that that is actually a slightly specious explanation, a slightly specious excuse. Good news can be found outside medicine, pharmacy and the arts. We do not look hard enough, I believe, for good news. And when we find it, I think that we give it too little prominence in a world that is awash with bad news. That said, good news can be hard to sell. A story like that, another prosperous, peaceful day in Gotham City, is probably going to sell fewer copies of the Gotham Times than that. Batman, Wax, Joker. The same is true of creative media. Yes, depictions of what is most tender in life do appear on the silver screen. But a lot of the time the focus is also on crime, violence and war. And that brings me to an assessment of the validity of that slightly specious defence that I mentioned earlier. It is borne out in poor part, not only by what happens in the creative media, but also in what is happening in the social media. The effect of digital communications, uh, the effect of the internet, is to remove intermediaries of all kinds, not just in the media. If you want to sell your house now, it's very possible that you can sell directly through the internet and not have to go through a realtor. Um, if you want to sell your car, you don't necessarily have to go to a second-hand car dealer. You can sell it through Craigslist or whatever. The same is true in the area of journalism. It has placed the instruments of communication in the hands of everyone from the President of the United States, who has used that power to a great extent particularly with Twitter, or you, or the next person. Um, let me give you an example, a couple of examples. In the pre-digital age, a politician who wanted to get across her or his message would have to call a press conference. The reporters would sit there. They would take notes of what that person was saying. They would then, in some way, mediate it to the public. Sometimes they would introduce their own interpretation. Sometimes they would introduce their own bias. That is no longer necessary for a politician to do, to suffer. He or she can go directly to the voters over the heads of the media, the mainstream media. Um, if the individual wished to raise an issue in public, the only way in the old days was to pick up pen or paper or go and sit at what in those days was called a typewriter and send off a letter to the editor of the newspaper that had perhaps outraged them with their way of dealing with the news. So they had to find a stamp, they had to find an envelope, they had to go to a post office and mail the letter to the newspaper where it would be intercepted by somebody called the letters editor who would decide not only whether the letter appeared but how it would appear. Maybe it would have to be cut right back. So there was a huge amount of mediation that now no longer takes place because 
you or the next person can go on to Twitter or Facebook or whatever and put your opinions out there. Has that process promoted, though, the cause of peace? My answer would be no. Twitter thrives on dispute and extreme, even outrageous assertions and contentions. It has become not only the home of those who wish to vent a justified outrage about something that they've seen, but also the home of trolls and other internet vermin. Facebook is a platform that has hosted some of the most violent organizations and communities which hold extreme beliefs. Now, I don't want to be too hard on Facebook. It also has given a platform to some enormously worthy organizations. But the point that I'm making is that by handing the means of communication to non-journalists, the result is a mix that's not that very different from what we saw in the pre-digital age. The other point that arises is that the media be they mainstream, social or creative, are fundamentally amoral instruments. Not immoral, amoral. They do not carry a moral, an inherent moral value. They can be used for good or for bad. In the same way that they can be used to promote peace, they can also be used to incite war. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels, who was the Nazis' chief propagandist before World War II and had a large part to play in promoting, inciting that war. He was very adept, as you can imply from that picture, at using what in those days was the cutting-edge technology of radio. So, how can the media promote peace rather than inciting war? Or is the question really, how does the media promote peace? I'm going to propose to you three ways in which they do or should promote peace before going on to discuss one area in which, in my opinion, the mainstream media are not doing anywhere near enough to prevent conflict. Let's look first at the way in which I believe the media can and does promote peace by bringing home to people the reality of conflict and violence. In this area, still photography otherwise increasingly neglected, it's increasingly difficult to um, sell news magazines of the type that were the prime vehicle for great still photography. Still photography remains uniquely powerful. It's no exaggeration to say that two images turned the tide of the most traumatic war in the United States history, the Vietnam War, in the 1960s and the 1970s. One of those images was this, of a napalmed child, a little girl, starkly naked, screaming in agony, running towards the camera after a napalm attack that incinerated her village, her clothes, and finally her skin. That girl was Kim Fook. She was nine years old in 1972 when that picture was taken. The photographer, Nick Oot, Vietnamese, drove her to hospital after she received first aid. But her ordeal did not end there. Kim Fook had 17 surgical procedures, including skin grafts, and it was not until 10 years later that she was able to move properly. 
She was in constant pain throughout that time and at one point committed suicide. But the story has a happy ending because after being used as a propaganda figure for many years by the um, communist regime in uh, Vietnam, she was allowed to go on a honeymoon and stopped in Canada, applied for political asylum and now lives there. The second image is one that you are, I am sure, all very familiar with. From two years earlier, 1970, um, the lady in the picture, though she may not look it, is actually only 14 years old. Her name is Marianne Vecchio, and she is screaming out as she kneels over the prone, dead body of Geoffrey Miller, who has just been shot dead by the National Guard. Um, you may be interested to know that two of the members of the audience tonight here were present when that took place. This iconic photograph was taken by a local newspaper photographer and Kent State photojournalism student, John Philo, who went on to become head of photography at CBS, a position that I believe he still holds. Philo's image works on several levels. It is a brilliant photograph, cropped as here. Um, it takes on the intensity of a painting. Uh, this has, to my mind, the intensity of a Renaissance masterpiece by someone like Masolino or Mantegna. It captures the outrage and despair of a young woman, a girl really, confronting the terrible finality of death, and in the case of Marianne Vecchio, almost certainly for the first time in her life. Philo, the photographer, said afterwards, after the shots were fired, I started to flee, ran down the hill, and stopped myself. Where are you going? I said to myself. This is why you are here. And I started to take pictures again. It points to the fact that journalists in situations like that have to overcome the very natural instinct to flee. What we do in those circumstances is frankly profoundly abnormal. Um, back in the 1990s, early 1990s, I was correspondent for the Western Mediterranean for my newspaper and there was a, one of the periodic outbreaks of violence in Algeria which led up to its brutal civil war and I and various other correspondents flew in on a plane of the only airline at that time that was prepared to fly into Algiers which was Iberia and um, when we got to the main state-run hotel in Algiers, um, we um, noticed that there were a couple of men there who were the only, apparently the only guests in the entire large hotel. And I and a correspondent from the Times of London got chatting to, him, to, to them one evening and we ended up having dinner with them. And um, they were slightly mysterious characters. Um, they talked about having brought somebody back to Algiers uh, and um, we both at the end decided that they were probably intelligence agents uh, who had not been given clearance to leave when the violence broke out. And uh, over dinner, uh, one of them said, you know, it was bizarre being here um, after the shooting started because the hotel was full of delegates to a conference of the um, Union of African Unity, an organization of African Unity. And he said they all descended on reception and they were all banging on the counter and saying the hotel had to give them a, a bus with which to get to the airport to get away from the, from the uh, violence that was breaking out all over Algiers. And he said the bus was found and they, they disappeared and a couple of hours went past and suddenly the doors swung open again at the hotel 
and a mob of people rushed in and were started banging on the reception and demanding to be let in and be given a room in the hotel. And he said, I turned to my friend and I said, these people must be crazy. <laughs> um, they are trying to get in where everybody else is trying to get out. And my friend turned to me and he said, no, they're not crazy, they're journalists. And that was what proved to be the case. We were all trying to get in where everybody else was trying to get out. Some of the finest photography and the best reporting comes from the front line. But on the issue that I'm trying to identify now, bringing home to people the reality of conflict and violence, and in doing so, hopefully, making sure that people do not slip easily into using violence and conflict to resolve their differences. In that area, much of the best work done by journalists is away from where the bullets are flying. These are two images, for example, from the Kosovo conflict, which I covered. One is of uh, a Serbian woman and the other of an Albanian woman. One has lost her house, the other has lost her husband. Um, looking back at my own reporting from that war, I think that I actually achieved far more talking to victims in the refugee camps than sitting under circling B-52 bombers waiting for them to blow Serbian military positions to smithereens. Um, at this point, I want to express a concern. A concern about the growing tendency to give an absolute primacy to the protection of the sensibilities of people in many situations, notably in the consumption of media, but not only. Um, right now, there is an exhibition on in London at the British Museum. It is called Troy Myth and Reality, and it's about the Trojan Wars way, way back in antiquity. And as you go into the museum, there's a notice that confronts you, and it says, Troy Myth and Reality tells a story about war. It contains depictions and discussion of violence and other aspects of conflict. Now, I agree that warnings should be given on, for example, television news bulletins, especially of particularly violent or otherwise disturbing scenes, because there are people who are particularly vulnerable to those images. But I think there is also a danger that we can go too far and give people a distorted and unduly benign image of what happens when you resort to firearms and explosives to settle your disputes. And I think that's particularly relevant in a world where movies and shoot 'em up video games are giving a bang, you're dead image of conflict. So much for my first argument that we can help to promote peace by bringing across to people the true reality of war. The other, the second way rather, in which the media, I believe, can help to promote peace is by ensuring that people are given the truth and not lies. We have a duty to hold politicians and rulers to account, and nowhere and never more so than when the issue is war or peace. Numerous wars have been started by people telling lies. Just one example from the 18th century. King Gustav III of Sweden an amiable looking chap, I think you will all agree, needed somehow to distract his subjects, many of whom were calling for his removal from the throne. 
So he set about provoking a war with Russia. What he did was he got his aides, his courtiers, to go to the National Opera and to ask them to provide some of his royal guards with Russian uniforms. The guards were then dressed up in the Russian uniform and thus disguised, they raided an outpost on what was then the border between Swedish and Russian territory. The Swedish parliament obviously thought the attack had been carried out by Russian soldiers and authorized dear old Gustav to retaliate, sparking a war that lasted for two years and left 6,000 people dead. Now, nothing like that could possibly happen in our media age, could it? Well, yes, it could, and it's happened pretty recently. The Iraq War of 2003. America and Britain, who invaded Iraq, justified their aggression, because that's what it amounted to under UN law, by the claim that Iraq's dictator, Saddam Hussein, possessed weapons of mass destruction that threatened the very existence of life on Earth. Something that was doubted by their own intelligence services at the time, and which was later discovered to be totally untrue. Sadly, even casting severe doubt on the veracity of the official version, the official reason for going to war, uh, which happened in this case, many journalists wrote articles, made TV programs, made radio programs, put stuff out on the internet saying that perhaps this was a rather flimsy argument for invading Iraq. Despite all of that, it didn't work. Even more sadly, journalists and their proprietors, it has to be admitted, have incited wars and not helped the cause of peace. America's 1898 war with Spain is a case in point, partly, largely, the result of warmongering by the newspaper magnet William Randolph Hearst. The third and, I would say, crucial way in which journalists can contribute to peace is by warning of threats to peace, by drawing attention to what could be the causes of a war. This is an area in which I believe that the media, the mainstream media, and not just the mainstream media, is currently not playing the role that it should. In the long term, the number one threat to peace on our planet is surely global warming. Let me spell out the several ways in which it poses that threat, not only to our existence on the planet, but to the peace of our times and those of our children and grandchildren. It will cause movements of people, and perhaps of entire peoples. It will increase competition for resources of all kinds, which will become scarcer, especially water. This is a process that is already taking place in the so-called Sahel, the band of territory to the south of the Sahara Desert. These are classic recipes for conflict. You can find examples of this playing out again and again in history. Young people of your age are right to see this as the issue of our times, but more particularly their times, your times, those of you in the audience under the age of 30. 
This is about whether our planet will continue to be habitable. And frankly, as somebody in his 60s, I am shocked by the complacency and indifference of my own generation. I am shocked by the excuses that I hear, which range from, well, the experts are probably wrong the way they were with the millennium bug, across to science, I am sure, will find an answer in time. I'm shocked, too, that I have yet to hear truly impassioned speech by a Western politician in favour of making this our number one and absolute priority. I think that when historians look back at this time, they will be amazed that no one found it in themselves to come out with a speech on the level of Ich bin ein Berliner or I have a dream, that what we need uh, or needed at this time was a Martin Luther King or a John F. Kennedy to be able to put this issue right at the top of our agenda. That leads me to a further danger, a further threat to peace, which I see in this, that people, young people, who can see the importance of the problem may become so frustrated that they turn to terrorism. That is already being contemplated by the authorities in my own country, one of my own two countries, I should say, uh, in the United Kingdom, who have put the movement Extinction Rebellion on a list that also includes far-right and far-left-wing um, terrorist organizations. They are anticipating that this could happen. Are the media doing enough to draw attention to this existential issue? Broadly speaking, my answer is no. Let's look at, first of all, mainstream media. Journalists are taught to look for the story in amongst all the confusion, the distraction, the diversions that are laid in your path by spin doctors and so on. We're taught to go for what is really the nub of the issue. This, in a global sense, is clearly the story. Yet it is consistently being treated as one of many. Brexit, border walls, the rise of China, Catalan separatism and global warming. There are honourable exceptions. I would mention particularly the radio BBC World Service, which does keep hammering away day after day on this point. I see less of that in the other leading journals of my time. I see fewer of them who are prepared to say not only that this is an important issue, which I think all accept, but that it is the issue. Sadly, my old newspaper, The Guardian, the former editor, Alan Rusbridger, when he came to the end of a very distinguished tenure as the editor of the paper, went into a kind of spiritual retreat. He took some time out to go off somewhere lonely to think about what it was that he had not done during his successful editorship. And he emerged from it saying, the big story that I've missed is, is this one, it's climate change. And he launched a campaign in the later months of his editorship under the title of Leave It in the Ground, um, urging people to not extract any more hydrocarbons from the earth. Sadly, that campaign was dropped when he ceased to be the editor and his successor took over. The paper still reflects a strong interest in the issue, but again, I'm feeling that the, the lack of this urgency and priority that I think that the story 
should be given. Why is this? A fundamental problem is that it is a story that is intrinsically inimical to news values. Climate change is about developments and not events. It is about the melting of glaciers in Greenland. It's about the separation of icebergs from the Antarctic. It's about the gradual creep of the temperature in many parts of the world. As we saw a very good example today. It was 17 degrees today, the beginning of February in Florence, a city in which not often, not seldom in the past, has it snowed at this time of the year. Developments, not events. The media is entirely geared to events. The only events that it can latch on to with this story are the publications of scientific papers. And it's one of the ways, unfortunately, this emphasis on events rather than developments in which the media distorts reality. News is not truth. News is news. Added to that, developments that are happening, these are developments not only that are not events, but they are developments that are happening comparatively slowly, though perhaps what's just been happening in Australia is showing us that these things are happening more quickly than we had expected. The media, on the other hand, is geared to things that happen within the daily or at most weekly news cycle. Finally, and crucially, climate change is about things that are not happening, and the media is geared to things that do happen. You will never see a headline that says, President Trump yesterday did not rejoin the Paris Accord. That is not a news story. Something has to happen for us to regard it as an event worthy of coverage. Is social media helping, helping in this respect? To some extent, possibly yes, but I'm sceptical. What Twitter, Facebook and the like have done is to produce a blizzard of information so that the climate change issue becomes buried in this avalanche of other facts and opinions about everything from the um, state of the opposition in Uruguay to whether um, there has been a medical breakthrough in New Zealand. How about creative media? Documentaries I see as the outstanding exception to what I've been saying hitherto. The documentary world has stepped up to the plate. There have been some terrific movies made about the threats that we face. But fictional movies, one of the few to depict the effects of an environmental apocalypse was The Road, based on Cormac McCarthy's book of the same title. And that was back in 2009 and the reasons for the catastrophe that is at the origin of the whole story are never really spelled out. In fact, in the very first words of the movie, they speak about a blinding flash. That's not how climate change is going to destroy our planet. The same is true of the other Hollywood blockbuster of recent years, Interstellar from 2014. What is more, it offers a message that is fundamentally misleading. The plot is about an escape to another planet. But, ladies and gentlemen, we have nowhere to go that we know of. This is our only home. One of the most difficult things in the early stages of a journalistic career is to learn how to craft the intro sometimes called the lead, the first paragraph of 
the story, which in the Anglo-Saxon tradition at least should contain all the re relevant facts and be written in a way that draws the reader into the rest of the story. What older journalists sometimes tell younger journalists is to imagine that they have been to the event or they have reported on whatever and they've just walked into a bar and somebody turns around at the bar and says, what happened? Think what your answer would be to that and you've got the intro, the lead, the first paragraph because you will always come out instinctively with the most important points for the sake of conciseness. So let's apply that to our present situation. What should we be saying and what are we not saying? What we should be saying and what we're not saying is, my house is on fire and so is yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to open the discussion with any possible question you have for him. Yeah, I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on uh, the correlation. Thank you. The correlation between like the twenty-four hour media like media cycle and that like whether or not it promotes or halts the like uh, process of peace versus war. Um. <sighs> I think there are two issues here. One of them is that 24 hours contributes to that blizzard of information that I talked about. And in that sense, I think it's very negative. 24 hour news could, I think, be very constructive uh, in actually allowing us time to follow an event and to give insight to what is happening. And sometimes that is the case, coverage of an election, for example. But I was very disappointed in the way that 24-hour news dealt with something I mentioned during my talk, the invasion of Iraq. There was a classic example of where you could bring in pundits to really explain what was happening and to match that up with what the reporters were saying in the field and see where you got an interface. Um, in the event, that didn't really happen. The reports were actually quite misleading at a number of levels, not least the likely success of the original invasion, which I don't know if you remember, no, got bogged down in a sandstorm. And a lot of the reporters were saying that it was a failure, it's turning into a failure, um, and only one person actually, it seems to me, got it right, who was the military correspondent of the Daily Telegraph uh, in London, who said, nonsense, they will be in Baghdad, to great ridicule, I might say, he said, they will be, with, they will be in Baghdad within 24 hours, and they were. Um, so 24-hour news, I think the problem is that if it just skims the surface, then it's of very little use. It doesn't really add that very much. I mean, I've spent many hours listening to my poor colleagues desperately trying to improvise something rather new to say over a very slow-moving story. In that sense, no, I don't think that it really adds very much. And in terms of promoting peace, really very, very little. Hello. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you said um, that one of the most important ideas that the media is failing to do is to communi communicate about climate change as a development rather than a series of events. What are the ways that the media in the future, or us as our own smartphone journalists, can communicate this idea of the longevity and importance in you know, development of climate change rather than you know individual case in Southeast Asia, individual case in Australia, individual case here, in a way that communicates the holistic seriousness of climate change to maybe not even just people in our generation, but above us. Four words. Revive the news feature. Um, this has been a casualty of developments, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, the news feature, the idea was that you take the news event, but then you give the background to it. Um, what I think we get a lot of now is 
opinion, often by non-journalists, and nothing wrong with that, um, on a particular subject, on a particular event, without um, having um, the the uh, anal the anal analysis that is required. So it's very easy to sound off to say that you're on one side or the other and throw in a few facts to justify your case. If you can get a proper analysis, and it doesn't have to be written by a journalist, in some cases it ought not to be written by a journalist, particularly I would say when it comes to climate change. What you need is scientists weighing in after an event such as we saw in Australia, explaining where that fits in or might fit in to the general pattern, but making the point that there is a general pattern. And I think that that retreat from that formula, which used to be a very common one in um, um, papers such as certainly The Guardian, which used to have what they called the facing page. So you'd have the editorials on one side and then you would have on the other side articles that were mostly written by their own staff, trying to go into greater depth about the stories that you saw on the front page of page three, which are the two target pages for the top priority news stories. The same was true of many newspapers in the past. Um, I think that the retreat of the Los Angeles Times, one of the great sufferers from the effects of the internet, uh, has aided that process because the Los Angeles Times was uh, excellent at being able to develop a story and go into great depth in reporting, not just the who, what, and where, but also the why. I have a question. Uh, you yes. as main, mainstream journalist, wondering what kind of freedom do you have to put on the top of a list an event or another, or you are asked by the newspaper to write down a piece. What kind of freedom do you have this way? Personally, I have very little because I'm a reporter, I'm a correspondent. I don't commission stories. I don't lay out pages. I don't lay out websites. Layout, by the way, is formatting um, a website page or a physical page. Um, I don't decide the running order of TV programs or radio programs. Um, so my, um, my freedom is restricted to making speeches like one tonight. Um, editors, on the other hand, have the degree of freedom that is allowed them by their proprietors. And this is an important point. We talk about the free press. It is a questionable definition of questionable description. We have a private press um, and that private press is in many cases controlled by a proprietor and his or her views. Um, a good formula hammered out after Rupert Murdoch, um, right-wing media magnate, took over the Wall Street Journal where most of the journalists are somewhere around about the center, maybe a little bit even left of center, was to make an absolutely radical division between op-ed and news coverage and features, so that you have an op-ed editor who does not report to the managing editor, he reports to the proprietor, the publisher. Um, the, all the, everybody else reports ultimately to the managing editor. I'm an occasional contributor to the Wall Street Journal, so I know it from the inside. That seems to me to be a good way in which to protect the liberty of your editors to decide what you put at the top of your, your priorities. Um, so I would say, yes, they have a generally free hand in most uh, news organizations. I'm being pretty careful here because I'm not even sure that most is quite right, but certainly a great number of, of news organizations. But they are subject to these constraints that I mentioned earlier, the constraints, if you like, of the, the self-imposed constraints of the profession. We've got to a point where we have these very strict internal rules about what is and what is not news. And it will take a very daring editor to actually break away from that 
and say, look, I think that we've got to put up on the front page something that has not happened today or something that is happening with exquisite slowness, but which is extremely important. Um, firstly, thank you for doing this. But um, as consumers of news, how do we sort of filter the overload of information, I guess, like from all these sources? As they say in Italian, bella domanda. <laughs> nice question. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Um, I think that you have to... Huh, I think there are two risks. You have to try and find a way to balance them. One of the things that's been lost in the transition from newspapers, physical newspapers, to news websites is the serendipity factor. Um, you are only interested really in the theatre, but you're flicking through and you see a fascinating headline, intriguing headline about um, Cambodia or um, engineering. And you read that article. You didn't intend to read it, but you do, because in order to get to the arts pages at the back, you have to go through those others. That doesn't happen on websites. And in fact, websites are constructed in such a way as to prevent you from doing that. They are very keen to get you to create a personalized website where only the things of interest to you will appear. So one dynamic is to push away from that, to try to broaden out not only to get news and features about things that you might not have thought you were interested in, but which perhaps are very important, but also to reach out to other opinions, because the echo chamber effect of social media has been well documented. The fact that Facebook, for example, puts you in touch by and large with people of the same opinions as yourself, a process that I have seen personally during the Brexit campaign, when I suddenly realised that everybody that I was that was coming up on my Facebook feed was somebody who thought, as I did, that Britain should remain inside the European Union. It actually took an effort of will and my going down my friends to find a few who were in favour of Brexit to to get their arguments, some of which were more valid than I I realised. Um, so that is one dynamic I think to. To, to, to reach out, to, to broaden. At the same time, you cannot possibly deal with this, I call it an avalanche, it's a tsunami of information that comes at you without finding some way to narrow it down. And perhaps the only way to do that is to ration the time that you spend on social media or surfing news websites, because that would preserve the random quality that I think is very necessary to have. So with, thing, so with things like climate change and the like, people can read an article, they can see all the experts that are quoted and still throw it away and say it's fake news. So what, in your opinion, is like the best way to fight that like fake news mindset that has kind of overcome our society? It really has gained traction, hasn't it? Yeah. And I think that I mentioned, in fact, when I was talking, that one of the responses that I sometimes hear is this, the experts always get it wrong. Um, I think that all we can do is to hammer away at the, at the idea that expertise is a value that people should take into due consideration. Um, but it's very difficult to change people's minds on this issue. I think if people have closed off their minds, then it is extremely difficult to open them up, except by pointing again and again, in this particular instance, to the dramatic changes that are taking place. And what I've seen um, in Australia and I've been looking quite carefully, actually, at the news 
no comment out of Australia recently, is a genuine turnaround in opinion. Things have been so dramatic there that people are now reassessing. And that even extends to people in the Morrison government. Um, beyond that, though, uh, it is very difficult to see a magic formula by which you can shake people by the lapels and get them to stop saying that climate change profits are doom mongers. Um, it is not something that I think can be done overnight, but it can only be done by gradual erosion. I think that one of the developments that we are going to see is that as a younger generation reaches voting age, as the Greta Thunbergs turn 18 in country after country, we're going to see a big change in public opinion. It's very interesting. I was listening the other day to, as I mentioned earlier, the World Service Radio uh, of the BBC. And there was a programme there about the another threat to peace, which is what happens in your petro economies when people suddenly stop using hydrocarbons. Is that not going to give rise to violence? Quite an abstruse argument, but a very interesting one. And one of the people they interviewed was a former chief executive of BP. Uh, his answer was that this was a process that would take place very slowly and people would have time to adapt. Then they turned to a pollster and they were talking to him about the same issue. And he said, well, all of our research, and Holster's overlap with market researchers, as we know, suggested that when the change takes place, it could take place with a bewildering suddenness, that the demand for hydrocarbons, when it does fall, is going to fall very, very suddenly indeed, and that that is going to be a big threat, not only for hydrocarbon economies, but also for the oil companies. So you've got a very different viewpoint there of how these things could take place. And I think that if you do get that sudden change in opinion, then your problem's solved. Maybe too late. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, my question is, um, if, if you ask our parents, they'll say that um, the, the decline of trust in the media kind of ended when Walter Cronkite retired. <laughs> and I, I, I want to know, one, if it's a U.S. issue or if it's kind of global, first of all. And, and two, it, like what, what happened with, with the decline in trust in the media? Was it the Internet? Was it the 24-hour news? Or like when, when did that start? What was that turning point? I don't have a, a lot of context in, in the news. Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. I think that you've got two factors in play. I think one of them is um, a genuine falling off of trust in the media, um, which possibly comes as a result of, uh, I think, various stories that the media got wrong. Um, I think that the Iraq war, in that sense, did not help. I think that all experts, all specialists, if you like, suffered as a result of 2008 and the global financial crisis, which not even the economists saw coming, much less the journalists. Really, the only people who did were a handful of hedges. Um, I think the other factor, though, is a more difficult one to describe, more complex, and requires a lot of study to work out, which is, I think, that a lot of people um, already distrusted the media, and that social media has given those people a platform such as they never had before. Um, I don't know whether you saw the old Jerry Seinfeld comedies, whether you recall the character of Kramer. Well, Kramer believed the New York Times, no, he once said to Jerry Seinfeld, you don't want to read that. 
You know, I mean, that's just full of bullshit, right? I mean, what you need to do is to go out there on the internet, and I tell you, there are these websites, they tell you the real truth, you know. They tell you, like, you know, Apollo never made it to the moon, that kind of stuff. Right? And I think that there are actually, God help us, far more Kramers out there than we had ever thought. And I think that that is the other element in it. So thank you very much for, for being here tonight. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>